Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this panel on inter interrogating uh, Duterte's pandemic resilience. We have a jam-packed panel for this uh, morning session. So let me first introduce our presenters. No? Our first presenter uh, who will deliver uh, a talk on Duterte's brute force governance during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is uh, Professor Mark Thompson. Uh, professor Thompson is uh, uh, head and professor of politics at the Department of Asian and International Studies. And currently he is the director of the Southeast Asia Research Center at the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, he will soon be followed by Clee Marguelles, who is currently a PhD student at the Australian National University. And currently he also teaches with the Political Science Department at De La Salle University. And then uh, for our third presentation in this panel, uh, uh, Cleve's presentation is entitled The Populist Brand is Crisis, Durable Dutertismo uh, Amidst Mismanaged COVID-19 Response. And then uh, for our third presentation, we have uh, the, uh, entitled Is Duterte's Popularity Real? Evidence from a Least Experiment in the Philippines. This is a co-authored uh, paper out of a recent uh, research, uh, Least Experiment uh, Survey in the Philippines, uh, headed by Yuko Kasuya, who is Professor of Political Science at the Faculty of Law, Keio University in Tokyo, Japan, and Hirokumi Miwa, who is Associate uh, Professor at the Department of Political Science Faculty of Law, Gakushuin University, Japan. And they are joined by uh, Professor Ronald Holmes, who is Professor of Political Science at De La Salle University and President of Pulse Asia. Uh, each panel has 15 minutes to deliver their presentation. And for our third presentation, Professor Kasuya will present and Professor Holmes uh, will join the panel in our Q&A segment. After the presentation, I will also uh, give my brief reaction and then pass the Zoom room to our PPSA board member, Mary Jane Naharilia, who will moderate the Q&A uh, segment. So without further ado, it's my honor to present, uh, to give you uh, our first presenter, Professor Mark Thompson. Mark, please. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, for that kind introduction, July. And I would like to thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Tianki for organizing this panel. I'd like to thank the um, PPSA for, for organizing this conference. I think uh, it's appropriate to be speaking about pandemic populism when we are conducting this webinar uh, in a, in, uh, under these circumstances because of, of the pandemic. Uh, I, I know we're all used to Zoom uh, these days, but uh, it's still, I think, quite an accomplishment uh, for for these things to, to be done so seamlessly. Um, and uh, just going back to uh, July, our colleague and, and, and dear friend, um, I do like to call myself uh, an FOJ, a friend of July. So uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, on this panel. I'm also very much looking forward to, to the other papers, so I'll try to go mind uh, as speedily as possible, avoiding any unnecessary jokes, which uh, July has already heard several times already, so uh, <laughs> no need for that. Um, as, uh, as mentioned, my topic is brute force governance, uh, so part of my talk will be explaining what that is and explaining its relevance to uh, pandemic populism under Duterte. So we, we all know about the uh, phenomenon of illiberal populism, which is uh, was a, a major topic before the pandemic, but of course has been accentuated by it. And I think an interesting take on it uh, was done by the uh, Philippine academic, uh, uh, Dr. Pomenon of Cambridge University, speaking of, of macho populism, bringing in a gender aspect, uh, which is applied, uh, she applied to Trump and, and, and Brazil's Bolsonaro, but I think few would doubt that it is also very applicable to uh, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte for reasons I don't need to go into in any detail. Uh, another concept very useful, I think, is uh, another a Philippine scholar uh, from the University of the Philippines, Lasco, uh, talks about medical populism, 
simplifying the pandemic uh, by downplaying its impacts, spectacularizing responses to it, dividing good people from dangerous others. So I think those are two concepts just uh, as a general introduction when we're thinking about this uh, topic. As we know, the Philippines has been particularly hard hit um, in terms of the number of cases and uh, deaths, uh, the highest in ASEAN, um, hunger incidents, uh, which uh, was particularly high uh, toward the end of last year, uh, up to uh, more than a quarter of the uh, population in poorer regions, according to an SWS survey. And as we know, the economy has plunged and it has become the worst performer in ASEAN. So, you know, it, it's very difficult to, to assess performance during this pandemic. Countries have gone through ups and downs, not just the Philippines, but uh, on these objective measures, it does seem that uh, performance uh, by the Duterte administration has been everything but stellar. And here is where I introduce uh, the concept of uh, brute force governance, whether it uh, was his uh, bloody war on drugs, as you uh, probably all heard, the International Criminal Court has initiated uh, proceedings uh, going ahead to, to, to look into the uh, murders by police vigilantes on the war on drugs and uh, the pandemic lockdowns. I'm suggesting, not surprisingly, that they were instrumentalized by Duterte uh, using his very limited repressive repertoire, his iron fist rule as vigilante president, as uh, Sheila Cornell has termed it. Uh, Duterte bypasses Congress through direct popular appeals, making him less reliant on traditional patronage politics, as Kasuya Tianki argued recently. Courts have been cowed, police corrupted, uh, and yet by demonstrating apparent decisiveness, he's deflected from governance failures, and the harm he's done to the poor majority of the country uh, with his continued popularity, although we'll hear more about how popular he really is, but I think there's no doubt that he remains a uh, highly popular president, um, shows uh, that this has been an effective uh, legitimation strategy. So what, what am I talking about? Um, it's an idea that uh, he's using a kind of governance where one size uh, fits all, uh, on a broad population based not on any sort of objective criteria, but rather preconceptions and prejudices. And he's particularly targeted what uh, in old fashioned Marxist terminology was called the lumpen proletariat. Uh, a second feature is it's uh, extremely repressive and detrimental to the welfare, obviously in the extrajudicial killings, but also in the suffering, the hunger and other problems during the long lockdowns. And third, it's crucial to uh, democratic illiberalism. Uh, this is uh, the idea of uh, uh, Papas, for example, uh, that populism is defined this way. Um, it's a legitimation strategy uh, that transcends social classes, uh, appeals both to the civic middle class as well as to the poor masa using the uh, words of Kusaka. Also, of course, the uh, work of, uh, of Cleve Arguelles would be talking to us next is very relevant in that regard, the, the, the identification of, of many, including the poorest Filipinos with, with Duterte. So why this um, brute force governance? Um, it's interesting, there, there is some uh, research about uh, how kind of, kind of a vigilante politics will win moderate public support under any circumstances, uh, but it's even more so the case when institutions are weak and corrupted in a highly oligarchical system, such as in the Philippines, that's been unable over decades to produce uh, favorable governance outcomes. Um, brute force governance is also more likely when issues are securitized, which obviously Duterte did with the drug issue, uh, but also in, in certain aspects of the pandemic. Um, it leads to demands for immediate uh, decisive action, um, but it's a puzzling phenomenon because as I said, uh, we have clear evidence of its ineffectiveness, its inhumanity, and that it actually worsens governance outcomes, causing immense suffering, distracting from developmental failures, as well as the inadequate medical infrastructure and other problems uh, that have been revealed during this uh, pandemic in the Philippines. So what's the, what's the significance of this? Well, it's the promise of disciplina, the cutting short of, uh, uh, of, of you know, the difficulties of governance to get uh, a quick solution, a quick fix, uh, and it does cater both to uh, middle class uh, prejudices, the need to uh, discipline a uh, recalcitrant population, but also, and this is very interesting and, and I think often misunderstood, uh, that anthropological research such as Jensen and uh, Hapal, sorry, misspelling there, of 2018 show 
uh, the poor's desire to be uh, for a moral citizenship. Uh, this is something Kusaka's research and uh, Arguelles has another have, have pointed to as well. Uh, it justifies executive aggrandizement. You have to be a tough and strong executive to get these things done, of course. Uh, restraints on the executive are, are, are everything other than useful in such a circumstance. As I said, it's a successful legitimation uh, strategy and, and uh, key to understanding the success, popularity-wise anyway, of the Duterte administration, despite widespread corruption, cronyism, poor performance, uh, its economic difficulties and enhancing uh, diff and its inability to enhance public welfare on the contrary. So briefly to review uh, the war on drugs, which we're all very familiar with, uh, the point I want to make here is simply that the war on drugs is not uh, something that he's popular despite of. It's his signature program, and that's the key to understanding why uh, his intense popularity to begin with, even if it may be waning somewhat more recently, uh, and have other factors uh, involved in it, as we'll hear uh, in the final paper. Um, I also think it's important to say that it's much more than penal populism, which has been common in the West, because it's not just about long sentences, but mass killings by police vigilantes. Uh, also, uh, this is a point that Al McCoy has made about the local origins of, of Duteatismo, uh, how he nationalized the neo bossa strategy in Davao, conquering Imperial Manila, as it were, with this strategy, uh, which was very appealing after the failure of liberal reformism and after proletarian populism of Estrada and uh, his uh, fellow movie star politician, uh, FPJ, who was cheated in the 2004 elections. Um, also, we can point to Jojo Binai and the uh, selective Senate investigation that helped undermine his candidacy in 2016. The uh, British uh, expert Collins on uh, drug issues, having studied this globally, uh, foresaw that uh, Duterte's drug war would fail and society would emerge worse off from it. This was just as the uh, policy was starting. And even Tatati has had to uh, admit that the ability to cut off uh, or reduce supply has, 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 has not worked out. Uh, police corruption and impunity have undoubtedly been worsened by the drug war. Uh, but as uh, Australian scholar uh, Rodin argues, this has distracted uh, from the country's uh, governance failures, this uh, sense of decisiveness. Um, in terms of the pandemic, uh, the blaming of the Pasawai is an interesting phenomenon. This is, I'm drawing on an article uh, just published by Hapa, an anthropologist I mentioned earlier. Uh, despite one of the strictest and longest lockdowns globally because of inadequate testing, contact tracing, underfunded healthcare, and also just a sense of, you know, working with the community rather than us against them, uh, you know, getting those uh, bad, uh, undisciplined uh, Pasawai in, in, in line uh, with this draconian, highly militarized approach. Uh, COVID-19 securitization reinforced a warlike narrative, which, as uh, Hapal argues, produces this subject, the Pasawai, the perpetual enemy of health and order that uh, requires disciplining and policing. Um, and this, and I fully agree with the statement uh, of Hapal's, informed by deep-seated class prejudices, very similar to what we saw in the drug war with the targeting of small-time users and dealers, not the big kingpins, of course, who often got off. Uh, as well as, of course, uh, Duterte's authoritarian tendencies. So in conclusion, it's a kind of sledgehammer approach I'm talking about, militarized and repressive, but it's implemented crucially by a democratically legitimated leader, uh, I, 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 albeit one who's highly illiberal. So this uh, democratic illiberalism of Papas uh, very much on display with Duterte. Uh, others uh, are to blame these ne'er-do-wells uh, for the problems that exist that have to be solved by Duterte's iron-fisted approach. Um, governance outcomes are wor uh, worsened. Uh, this extreme dichotomization of good people uh, versus criminalized others can legitimate even mass murder, uh, as well as extreme administrative incompetence, as we've seen during the pandemic, with a populist breakthrough in a weak state which has a poor record of human development. And on that rather pessimistic note, I will end and pass on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Now, uh, can we hear uh, Dee? Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, July. Let me just start sharing my uh, presentation.
So I hope you guys are seeing my presentation. Again, thank you everyone for joining our panel for today and thank you to my fellow pan panelists and our panel chair. Um, these are big names in Philippine politics. So I'm really happy to be part of this panel. The title of my presentation is The Populist Brandis Crisis, Durable with Our Peace Mo Amid's Mismanaged COVID-19 Pandemic. I will really build on some of the points made uh, by Mark in his previous presentation, but since my training is really in um, populism scholarship, I use that um, I use that lens to actually um, pick up uh, the same points. So I will be drawing on my ongoing PhD research, and um, this was also recently published at Southeast Asian Affairs 2021. So as with the rest of the world, the coronavirus took the entire Philippines by surprise in early 2020. But the Philippine government's response, as we all know, was quite distinct. It placed the entire country in a highly securitized, world's longest and strictest lockdowns under brute force governance. Yet more than a year after, it had become clear that the sharp measures taken by the government failed to keep the outbreak from turning into a full-blown economic, health, political, and social crisis. But rather than as a curse, as others uh, and many observers would have expected, the mismanaged pandemic turned out to be a gift for the populist to turn in. The series of this administration's spectacular failures in curbing the spread of the virus did not make a dent in his popularity, at least significantly. Public trust and support for the Duterte's performance is still high. In fact, the crisis, in my view, gave him, a, gave him an opportunity to even be new public mandate for his illiberal agenda. How and why the third they managed to stay popular despite mismanagement of COVID-19 response is the subject of my presentation today. So there are explanations being offered on the durability of the third piece amidst the pandemic. And um, some observers have pointed out to the climate of fear as a possible explanation. Um, under this explanation, survey respondents are supposed to be fearful and they uh, feel compelled to give positive assessments of the president's performance uh, amidst the public health crisis. So, for instance, we have um, sociologist Randy David. Uh, he argued that people uh, feared ending up in the drug war list or, for example, being denied government aid or ayuda. Hence, they were forced to positively respond to surveys. Uh, Pulse Asia President uh, Ronnie Holmes, who is with our panel today, um, in an interview said that, well, he, did, he, he, he doesn't dismiss the possibility that fear, um, though it is incre incredibly difficult to measure, may actually be affecting the polling process. But he also points out that so far there are no significant indications in their past surveys, such as nonverbal cues or um, really high refusal rates that their respondents are more fearful or apprehensive than usual. So this only means that you know, if Filipinos are really systematically um, fearing government backlash against revealing their two true preferences, we should be able to see some indications. And um, we uh, have yet to see that uh, for now. Others also point to the rally around the plug effect as an explanation. So um, in this um, explanation, um, the expectation is that during war times or other similar crises, heads of government enjoy short-lived spikes in public approval due to assumed need for national unity and support to government leadership among citizens. Key to this phenomenon is the effective use of crisis rhetoric, often characterized by discourses of national unity amidst the university. The third is pandemic addresses, however, have been generally confusing and generally um, extremely um, divisive. Government plans to address the outbreak is rarely discussed, but instead focus on personal ramblings and maligning critics. So if you've seen the address, and I'm sure most of you did, his addresses are really hardly an example of the crisis rhetoric associated with what we call as the rally around the flag effect. So, my research offers an alternative explanation. I leave the social the discussion of the social dis desirability bias to our last um, set of uh, presentation, and I'm sure that um, they will uh, be giving provocative insights as well. But my research offers an alternative ex explanation using the lens of populism. So populism um, scholarship shows that populist leaders emerge 
manufacture and thrive in crisis because crisis create social conditions of widespread anxiety and insecurity that are particularly conducive for populist support. In short, populist brand is crisis. Our, I argue that unpacking the third is populist nature and his populist mobilization strategy is key to understanding how he used a mismanaged con uh, pandemic to his advantage. And this is what I will be discussing in a bit. But before that, I want to I want to um, point out to um, the significant, uh, to the series of significant, albeit shortly pushbacks that happened before um, uh, before we saw uh, a spike um, in the popularity of the president. And the series of spectacular failures as it appeared during the early days of the crisis, um, it gave observers the impression that public support for the Dirtismo can finally be disrupted. Um, that includes me. Uh, we were saying that this may result um, to a major damage in the popularity of the president. But these significant pushbacks um, just gave even more false hopes. These, these impressions were rather short-lived and will be proven eventually wrong. The first pushback uh, was among standout local government mayors. Um, sort of a symbolic assault to the president who claims to be a uh, mayor of the Philippines, right? So we have Pasig City Mayor Vico Soto who allowed the limited operation of um, tricycles for public transport despite the Malacanang ban. We have Marikina City Mayor Marcy, Marcy Tudoro who opened a COVID-19 testing facility despite lack of permits and DOH warnings. We also have Ormoc City Mayor Richard Urge. Uh, Richard Gomez, who led other um, local chief executives and other government officials in Eastern Visayas to oppose Senator Bongo's pet project Malik Provincia program and refused to facilitate the return of migrant and Metro Manila workers in the region um, during the pandemic. I argue that this is significant because these open criticisms of national government policies have been rather rare among local officials in the past years given the regular reign of threats and uh, of prosecution and violence that directly comes from the president. The second pushback came, and um, to our surprise, I think, from the Duterte-controlled Congress. Malacanang's emergency powers bill was eventually watered down by the president's allies in the legislature. Although, yes, the president's supermajority coalition in the lower house adopted in total the admin's version of the bill, which is fully expected, um, the third key allies in the Senate, led by uh, Senate President Tito Soto, have refused to support some of the most controversial provisions of the bill, and in fact even insisted on calling it a grant of special authority rather than emergency uh, powers. And last among the significant pushbacks uh, were the flood of criticism from unusually confrontational and vocal sectors, including media celebrities, health workers, and business associations. And as usual, uh, Duterte responded with contempt to this flood of criticisms. Uh, he even challenged health workers to gestation revolution against him if they will continue on going public about um, the mismanagement of the pandemic. And again, um, the pushbacks, however um, significant to my view, were rather short-lived. A few months into the, into the crisis, Dutertismo was on a roll again. He did shut down ABS-CBN, the, uh, the country's largest media network. They adopted the uh, dangerous uh, anti-terrorism law. And around this period, too, we've also observed uh, dozens of um, prominent human rights and peace activists have been murdered by unidentified suspects in the infamous um, Tokhang style of the war on drugs. And we've also had um, the Human Rights uh, Watch observing that during um, the height of the pandemic, during this period, there was a 50% spike in um, the killings, uh, uh, drug war related killings. So against this backdrop of mismanagement, uh, mismanaged pandemic, what it appears is that the 30 still has the support of Filipinos and he has yet to encounter any effective domestic backlash, even against his most illiberal agenda, including the brutal war on drugs or the abs event shut down. So what makes uh, the Duterteismo durable? As I've said, I argue that key to answering this question is to look at the dynamics of this populist, pal uh, populist politics. Populist mobilizations emerge, manufacture, and thrive in times of crisis. In fact, the third is not alone in um, this phenomenon. 
uh, populist leaders in other parts of the world, like uh, Brazil, Yair Bolsonaro, or India's Narendra Modi, they remain relatively popular despite similarly disastrous handling of the pandemic. So the populist mobilization strategy of Duterte during uh, the pandemic is a mixture of charismatic appeal and violence, both its use and the threat of its use. I think that's organizing logic behind his um, class differentiated response. And I think that there are three key elements that characterize this strategy. First, the populist Duterte capitalized on the widespread anxiety that resulted from the failed attempts to curb the virus outbreak. The poor are desperate for help, while the middle and upper class are af afraid of a breakdown in order. So on the one hand, the government's uh, Ayuda social amelioration program seemed to have reached its intended poor uh, beneficiaries. Independent polls would confirm that most Filipino households have in fact received ayuda, and for some, even more than once. On the other hand, uh, presidential briefings devoted great attention to assuring the public that any social unrest that might be triggered by the crisis would be dealt with accordingly. So I think he is speaking to the middle and upper class in this regard. Um, and this is not the first time that the third, of course, capitalized on the public's class differentiated as anxieties and insecurities. He already did this in 2016, uh, promising toughness on crime to appeal to the insecure middle class and compassion for the vulnerable to win the support of the anxious poor. So like in 2016, in many respects, this pandemic, I think, is a case of another a slow moving disaster. Uh, but in an even more overwhelming form that has once again made, made the social environment conducive for populist mobilization. Second, um, securitizing the pandemic also contributed to renewed public support for, for the peace mo. Aside from a militarized approach, um, the use of war language has also been central to this strategy. The 30th has consistently framed this government's uh, pandemic response as a war against COVID-19 or a war against invisible enemy. And um, other populist leaders have similarly used the same uh, war rhetoric. Modi compared, um, uh, Modi would use, for example, uh, that the battle of coronavirus is the same as the battle of the Mahabharata, while Trump would call himself a wartime president uh, for being uh, for uh, battling the COVID pandemic. So once the securitized framing of the COVID-19 crisis had been mainstreamed, it was easier for the public to see the populist Duterte as the ideal crisis manager. He has consistently presented and idealized himself as a brutal, strong, and uncompromising commander-in-chief, always ready for war. And again, this is not the first time that he did uh, securitize a public health issue. We know um, that in 2016, he used the same strategy and he had, it has worked very well for him in the case of the war on drugs. And as the flagship policy of the Dertismo, the highly violent anti-drug campaign is actually the foundation of the Dertis populist mobilization, um, as, as, as Mark also um, discussed. Paul Kenny and Ronald Holmes also found evidence that citizens who support the war on drugs are also more likely to be attracted to the to the third test charismatic appeal. So I argue that securitizing the pandemic actually sets the stage for public support for the third test populist politics. And lastly, while the coronavirus crisis could have served as an opportunity for the third to champion to champion national unity and rally the country to a common cause. He instead doubled down on the use of polarizing rhetoric. The pandemic has provided new excuses for attacking his own enemies. Media, opposition groups, human rights advocates, and other favorite uh, punching bags. The use of war language is especially useful for this purpose. It allows the third to identify a permanent enemy, the coronavirus, while also labeling those who challenge the government strategy as occasional enemies. Um, Mga pasaway and disciplined citizens violating quarantine protocols, media reporting on uh, mismanaged uh, handling of the pandemic. Uh, and like Brazil's Bolsonaro, he would regularly antagonize government critics and have the public pick aside. He has also regularly used um, the late night addresses to put accountability and blame on the supposed pasaway or undisciplined individuals who refuse to cooperate with the government measures. And independent polls would confirm that this narrative actually found a willing audience among many Filipinos. They blame protocol health, uh, they, they, they blame health protocol violators as the reason for the continuing pandemic. So the polarizing narrative being sold to the public is that 
ordinary, hard-headed Filipinos who refuse to follow basic rules are forcing the government to keep the harsh and coercive lockdown in place. And if the narrative is to be believed, then there is no other choice for the government but a top-down militarized approach that can bring order to a nation of undisciplined citizens. So thank you for uh, listening to my presentation and I look forward to the discussions later on. Thank you, Cleve. Uh, now uh, let's hear from Professor Yuko Kasuya. Yuko? Yes, uh, let me see. Oops. Right, can you see my slide? Hello? Yes, yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, July. Uh, I'm one of those uh, FOJs, friends of July, for the past 20 years. And uh, thank you so much for inviting uh, this paper for this panel. Uh, I'm so honored to join the Luminaries of Philippine Studies. Uh, and the paper we are presenting today is a joint work uh, together with Hirohumi Miwa of Gakushin Uni in University in Tokyo. and. Ronald Holmes uh, of De La Salle University. Actually, uh, we are at the very early stage of uh, this research project, and uh, we really appreciate any feedback you have uh, on this. And so um, let me start. Motivation. The immediate motivation of this, this research comes from the Pulse Asia report that we all are familiar that Duterte's approval rating was 91% in the September uh, Pulse Asia survey. Well, Crip Cleave also mentioned it. So uh, I believe many of us were surprised at this result and uh, we thought some explanation is called for, well, in scientific uh, way. And theoretical motivation of research are the following. So it's already a kind of a cliche, but uh, democratic backsliding became a global unwelcome uh, change since around the 2000s. And in many backsliding cases, well, uh, again, Cleve also talked about this, incumbents receive relatively high support from the voters. Well, examples uh, are many, uh, oops, excuse me, Bolsonaro, Chavez, uh, Duterte, Erdogan, Modi, uh, Orban and Trump. So the research puzzle here is that uh, voters in these countries routinely say that, oh, we support democracy. However, why do they support incumbents who attempt to support democracy? So this is the puzzle we would like to address in this paper. And for this question, Political science has a long uh, accumulation of uh, studies in the theme of, on the theme of support for authoritarian governments. I'm not going into details of this literature review for the interest of time, but there are mainly three types of explanations. One focuses on material benefits. The second one focuses on ideational preferences among voters. And third one, which is our focus, looks into so-called social desirability bias or SDB. This is the acronym we use uh, very often in, during my presentation, or uh, also known as preference falsification. So uh, SDB refers to the desire of respondents to avoid embarrassment and project excuse me, favor image to others. This is the definition of, general definition of SDB. Oops. Just a second. And then I, I would like to talk about why we are studying Duterte's Philippines. Of course, all of us are interested in the Philippines, but uh, there are some theoretical reasons that makes Philippines relevant uh, 
to address this type of question or the puzzle that I stated earlier. So Philippines is uh, one of the recent democratic backsliding cases that took the mode of so-called executive aggrandizement, which is the, the most common mode of backsliding in the recent uh, backsliding uh, wave. The other theoretical reason is, as we all know, the chief executive, President Duterte, is very popular despite his attempts to support democracy. And uh, we also know that there has been many explanations provided by uh, Philippine studies scholars, well, including the, the panelists uh, joining here today. Uh, we have heard from Mark and, and Cleve about how they would analyze the reasons why Duterte is so popular. But uh, again, we would like to offer a social desirability bias, SDB-based explanation of this phenomenon. And here are two specific questions we are addressing in our paper focused on uh, the Philippine setting. The first question is, do respondents falsify their preferences about the Delta due to social desirability bias? And if so, to what extent? We want to know the magnitude of social desirability bias. The second question is, under what conditions are respondents more vulnerable to social desirability bias? Or what type of people would be more uh, vulnerable to SDB? So these are the two questions we would like to address. And let me quickly go over how people have been analyzed uh, SDB in Philippine context. So, well, again, Cleve already talked about this, but when we heard the report by the Pulse Asia survey last year, that Duterte's approval rating was 91%. Many people either publicly commented or, or quietly suspected there must be something going on, something uh, what we call social desirability bias. And also some commentators, uh, including Ronnie here, uh, commented that uh, this mode of survey, which is face-to-face, -face, may have something to do with the sensitivity of uh, Filipinos because Filipino people in general are very sensitive to um, cultural context and um, they try not to embarrass people. And about the insights we already have about susceptibility of SDB is uh, the this climate of fear. Uh, again, Cleve, thank you for, for giving a heads up on this. And uh, another factor suggested by a team of, of economists in their recent paper is called hard behavior. Uh, this is basically um, equivalent of what many political scientists would call bandwagoning. And uh, the paper by Karane uh, et al. found that uh, among those poor and low income residents in Metro Manila, those who would perceive people in their community are satisfied with President Duterte registered higher presidential satisfaction. So basically, uh, well, this is, this is a uh, study limited to Metro Manila residents, but uh, survey, they found uh, in their survey that uh, there are some bandwagoning behavior going on. So based on these insights uh, already provided, we came up with six hypotheses. And uh, the first two are to test the existence of social desirability bias of well, our first question. The hypothesis one uh, is that uh, Duterte's approval rating is inflated due to the presence of SDB uh, among some respondents. And the hypothesis two is that the degree of SDB is higher in the face-to-face -face interview survey method than in the online survey method. So this 
tries to uh, address the difference in the mode of survey. Oops, sorry. The hypothesis three to five investigates the climate of fear thesis. The hypothesis three is that the respondents who personally know a victim of EJK are more likely to falsify their preference than well, those who don't. Hypothesis four is that the respondents who personally know a victim of red tagging are more likely to uh, falsify their preference. Hypothesis five is that Excuse me. Respondents who spend more time using online social media, such as Facebook and Twitter, are more likely to falsify their preference and express approval of the Delta than those who uh, spend less time. So here, what we are expecting is that the, those who look at uh, the social media site, Facebook and Twitter, are more exposed to the internet trolls and therefore the climate of fear might be more um, immediate to those people. And then finally, hypothesis six tests the hard behavior thesis, which, is all, which was already tested by some uh, economists uh, among metal money residents. But here we are trying to test it in the nationwide survey. The hypothesis six is that uh, those respondents who believe Duterte is highly popular in their community or barangay are more likely to falsify their preference and express approval of the Delta than those who do not believe so. So these are the hypotheses. And now let me talk about the research design part. Uh, as July was mentioning, in this project, we used a method of survey called list experiment in two settings. Uh, let me talk about the list experiment shortly. But so we conducted two uh, surveys in different settings. One is the Pulse Asia face to face survey, which they conducted uh, during February 22 to March 3 this year. And the sample size is 1,200. Second setting is a online survey. Uh, we used an uh, online platform called Lucid, and we conducted this survey at the same during the same week that Pulse Asia's face to to face survey was uh, were being implemented. So from February to February twenty six to March three of this year, and sample size is four thousand. And then let me briefly explain what list experiment does because uh, some of the audience here may not be familiar with this method. So this is a method basically to study sensitive questions. For example, someone might ask you, have you ever smoked marijuana? And well, in my case at least, well, I would say no, even if I had, and well, there may be many people like, like myself, and in this kind of context, as social scientists, we would like to know how, well, how many, how many percentage of respondents are actually telling lies, right? And so here we want to know um, the truthful uh, answers among those who might be lying, and a list experiment allow list experiment method allows us to measure this type of um, context. And then um, this is uh, how scholars conduct list experiment. First, uh, we randomly assign respondents to a treatment or control group, and then show respondents a list of items and ask how many items, well, but we are not asking which item apply to you, right? And the list, this list includes a sensitive item only in the treatment group, not in the control group. And then uh, we compute the difference in means between the two groups 
which represents the percentage of individuals whose answer to the sensitive item is yes. Well, this is called list up based approval ratings. And um, here are the example, well, the these two uh, tabs are examples of list for the treatment group and list for the control group. And the I have smoked marijuana before is the sensitive item. So we used this method in the context of present Delta in the Philippines. And the list question we asked was this. Well, um, since my Tagalog is poor, I'm not going to read out the Tagalog version, but, uh, but in English, of the politicians on, the, on this list, how many of them do you approve of, uh, how many of them do you approve of performing their duties? And uh, for the uh, treatment group list, we had Manuel Quezon, Ferdinand Marcos, Carson Curry Aquino, and Rodrigo Duterte. So Rodrigo Duterte is the sensitive item. For the list uh, of the control group, we only had Quezon, Marcos, and Aquino. And then uh, this difference in means between the treatment and control group is what we call list-based approval rating. Then, uh, after asking this list question, we also asked the direct question, DQ, in the survey. And here we asked, do you approve or dis disapprove of President Duterte's performance of his duties? And the respondents' uh, answer categories were approve, disapprove, or don't know. And then this percentage of respondents answering approve is what we call DQ or direct question based approval rating. Then uh, we can calculate the magnitude of SDB by subtracting uh, this based approval rating from uh, the DQ based approval rating. So formula number one and Hypothesis one expects that this formula number one is positive. And then hypothesis number two expects that magnitude of SDB in phase two phase survey minus magnitude of SDB in online survey is positive. So this is what we should be expecting if there uh, if there are some SDBs and uh, differences in SDBs uh, in terms of the mode of survey are important. And then for hypothesis three to six, when we compare the magnitude of SDB across subgroups. So for hypothesis three, we compared those who know a victim of EJK versus those who do not. For hypothesis four, we compared those who know someone who has been red tagged, red tagged versus those who do not. And for hypothesis five, we compared those who spent 60, uh, uh, more than 60 minutes a day using social networking services versus those who do not. And for hypothesis six, we compared those who perceive that uh, people in their barangay uh, satisfied about the Delta's performance versus those who do not. Then the results. So this is the main results of our study. And uh, let me first explain how to read this graph. So these numbers are point estimate of our analysis. And then the line segments or those the, the lines uh, in over the crosses or dots are the confidence intervals or so-called uh, margin of errors. And uh, for the, well, um, dot, well, that has explanation that, that, that well, uh, didn't, that has the note that SDB, well, that means, well, those dots 
refers to the magnitude of SDB, right? And uh, just to simplify our findings, the hypothesis, well, letter H1, H2, well, those letters in red means <clears throat> the hypothesis are statistically significant. And the black letters mean uh, those hypotheses were not significant, right? So for hypothesis one, our main hypothesis asking whether there was a social desirability bias in Duterte's approval rating that was very strongly supported. For the face-to-face -face survey, the direct, when we asked direct question, 89.7% of respondents said they support Duterte. But in our list question estimate, only 50.7% of respondents said they approve of well, what well, well, basically. Dali lang, sir, Dali lang Wait lang. Lang, sir. <laughs> and so the SDB here, the magnitude of, of SDB here is 89.7 minus 50.7, meaning 39.1 uh, percentage point belongs to SDB. So uh, this is the result for the face-to-face -face survey. And for the online survey, the SDB is, the magnitude of SDB is 28.3 percentage point. So these two results combined, we can say hypothesis one was strongly supported. For hypothesis two, we did not see a significantly st uh, statistically significant result. Let me, for the sake of time, let me go over to the next uh, slide. So this is the result showing uh, the estimates for hypothesis three to hypothesis six. Again, uh, the letters in red means it was significant, uh, it, it was statistically significant. And uh, here, well, cross mark shows SDB, what well, magnitude of SDB, and the dots shows difference of SDB between subgroups. And basically what this graph shows is that uh, hypothesis three, four, five were not uh, statistically significant, but uh, hypothesis six was. So this was the hard behavior or bandwagoning uh, hypothesis. For for this hypothesis, our um, estimate is showing it's, it is statistically significant. Oops. So uh, let me conclude. Uh, I would like to offer two points for the conclusion. Uh, the point one, about one third of Duterte's approval rating came from social desirability bias. Well, that, mean, that is respondents are not giving truthful answers in surveys as of early 2021. Well, I would like to remind you that uh, our survey is limited to the, the timing that we conducted. And um, we would like to, well, hear your comments and opinions as to how we can generalize this finding. To, to a more uh, general setting. And uh, another concluding point is that the Filipinos who believe their neighbors support Duterte were more likely to succumb to social desirability bias. And two points uh, concerning the implications of this project uh, are the following. The first, in, the first one is about Philippine politics. So um, the results of our paper might imply that uh, support for President Duterte may be waning quickly when people perceive that he is no longer popular. And I'm suspecting I might be wrong and I would like to hear what other uh, people would say, uh, but uh, 
like what happened to Estrada in 2000 to 2001, once the tide changes, his popularity might dwindle. The second implication is for the comparative politics, um, which is that the high support for authoritarian incumbents should not be interpreted as an indication that voters are giving up on democracy, as some pundits have argued. All right, well, this is uh, about it. And thank you so much for listening. And uh, again, as I said, uh, we welcome any feedback uh, you might have. And uh, if you have any questions and comments, please email me. All right, thank you so much. Maraming salamat, Yupo. Thank you very much for a, a fascinating presentation. Uh, it's, I think, a path breaking uh, pre uh, research. And uh, I wish you all the best with your continued uh, research on social desirability bias. No? I'd like to acknowledge uh, one of your co-authors who's uh, now with us in the panel, uh, Professor Ronald Holmes. And I, I think uh, Hirofumi uh, Miwa is also uh, in attendance. No? So uh, let me just uh, give a brief reaction to uh, all the presenters. And uh, uh, we are indeed fortunate to have had uh, uh, excellent presentations this morning uh, regarding a very timely and relevant topic. No? Um, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic crisis has become an unfamiliar enemy no? uh, for Duterte and his populist counterparts around the world. No? And uh, uh, despite, as uh, most of our panelists mentioned, the longest lockdown in the world, Duterte has struggled to tame the pandemic. No? And uh, of course, it shows that one cannot just discipline the virus. No? Uh, but one of the biggest puzzles no, is why he remains popular. No? It is not enough to simply dismiss the surveys that says he is popular. No? And our distinguished panelists uh, offered us some possible explanation to what we call Duterte's pandemic resilience. No? Please allow me to briefly frame my reaction into three questions or three parts. No? The first is the conduct of the government, no? an agential question. And uh, the second is the context or the institutional uh, arena of uh, the pandemic. And uh, the third is the uh, narrative or the discursive setting of the entire uh, pandemic. No? So for the first question, no, uh, let us ask how leaders responded to the pandemic no? and how the people reacted. No? This essentially is from an agential perspective. No? As Professor uh, Thompson's presentation had shown, Duterte has taken an illiberal response or what he calls brute force governance to the pandemic. Uh, in this regard, he took the same path as his fellow liberal populists, as already uh, identified by our panelists, no? Orban, Modi, uh, Erdogan, and, and the others. No? For these leaders, the crisis offered an opportunity to draw a dividing line. Instead of uniting, no? uh, they, drew, they used the pandemic no? as an opportunity to attack their opponents and strengthen their own position. And as we have seen uh, in the past year, you know, the closure of ABS-CBN, the passage of the anti-terror law, and the red tag. But this begs the question why he has not faced massive outrage. You know? And as Cleve mentioned, uh, there were uh, uh, limited pushbacks, you know? short-lived. You know? And how come the uh, there were no massive protests and he managed to maintain his popularity, particularly uh, with his base. No? And Cleve's presentation argued that this is part of the entire logic of populist mobilizations, no? uh, where uh, populist mobilization emerged from manufacture and tribe in crisis. No? So, uh, of course, uh, if you saw that, uh, that recent movie with Sandra Bullock, Our Brand is Crisis, uh, that is exactly what Duterte is all about. His brand is crisis. No? In his view, uh, in uh, Cleve's view, Duterte thrives in crisis, and the more he divides, the more he strengthens his base with the populist public. No? So again, that begs the question, uh, 
uh, should the opposition or the critics of Duterte uh, out uh, out Duterte Duterte no? uh, in terms of uh, polarizing narratives no but of course it is not a matter of blaming no the so called uh, Duterte followers or the so called bobotantes no we have to understand what attracts them to Duterte and there are two other uh, perspectives no the second one is the institutional or the structural perspective you know, how governments responded to the pandemic and how effective these responses appear to be uh, of course, the jury is still out. Uh, most social scientists and political scientists are still doing research, conducting research on whether uh, the larger structural and institutional questions of which regime type uh, was able to address the pandemic uh, effectively, whether it's democratic or autocratic, uh, whether uh, formal political institutions, like for example, uh, is it better to have a unitary government or a federal form government or presidential or parliamentary and those who focused on state capacity whether it's weak or strong so it all falls within that question of whether we've had good or bad systems no and uh, the pandemic definitely in the philippines and the way this administration handled revealed some weakness in our institutions particularly in public health and one uh, often criticized aspect of the this government's response is the militarization or securitization of uh, the uh, response to the pandemic through the highly militarized uh, interagency task force. No? But of course, there have been other social policy programs or institutional uh, features that also have helped Duterte maintain his popularity. For example, the existence of uh, uh, the conditional cash transfer, the Pantawid Pamilyang Pilipino, or the uh, uh, social amelioration program, uh, the Ayudas, no, that uh, that were distributed to uh, those who were affected during the lockdown. And then, of course, the LGU who stepped up, uh, the local chief executives who stepped up in crisis management. And, of course, the nature of the task force in which you have a centralized uh, in interagency task force, and yet uh, most of the uh, implementation are done through the local government units. No? So uh, these questions no, point to uh, whether we've had good or bad systems. But of course, this will take another panel or another webinar to fully discuss. I think tomorrow, Professor Kasuya will also mention this uh, in her keynote. Uh, with regard to the study with varieties of democracy. The third and last question that we should ask is the ideation, ideational perspective or what stories were told. You know? Critics of the administration tend to frame government response in terms of what uh, Wataru Kusaka called uh, moral politics, you know? uh, an us versus them, moralistic good governance, kami ang disenke, uh, we are magaling, no kind of narrative, no. But moral politics is the mirror image of populism. It's the exact opposite, no. But just like populism, no, which is also an us versus them, uh, populists tend to privilege or reify the masa, no, and the so-called victims of criminality, no. Uh, these are the pastos, no, who are against the elitista, no. So. Uh, Kasuya et al. offered us fresh insights no, from their least experiment or social desirability bias framework. No? And uh, this is part of the growing uh, literature of, that deals with questions of, the, of fear in the illiberal populist uh, uh, settings, no? the so-called herd mentality, or the utang na loob, no? or the... Uh, 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 the worship of the father image or tatay. No? But the pro I, my concern with these types of uh, study, uh, uh, despite the fact that it opens up you know, new potential explanations to, to this puzzle that we're addressing, is an epistemological or ontological one uh, with regard to questions of agency. No? Uh, and 
there might be an inherently anti-poor, even anti-democratic bias if we say, and this is similar to what most uh, of our colleagues uh, have uh, have uh, raised regarding some current studies on trolling or social media. There is a tendency to view audience as the people, as simple receptors or receivers of government propaganda or intimidation, or what is now known as zombies. No? But uh, this begs the question of agency. No? And if we don't try to understand this, no, we cannot truly understand and find uh, explanations to this puzzle of the populist public and why Duterte is still popular. So thank you very much for listening. Now I will now pass on uh, the Zoom room to our moderator uh, who will now uh, take questions from both the uh, uh, attendees and and uh, those who would like to ask their questions live. No? Thank you very much. Mary Jane? Yes, sir. Good morning po. I'll be reading questions from the Q&A uh, panel since we have, uh, I think, eight. So let me read the first one from Matthew Ordonez to any of the panelists. So anybody from the three speakers could answer. Many scholars acknowledge that Duterte uses his personal machismo Yet most of his presence is mainly established through recorded messages throughout long periods of absence. Some people even theorize his death several times. How is this personal authority intact despite his weak health? How do you think the regime is able to function? Despite his weak health, uh, how is his personal authority intact despite his weak health? How do you think? the regime is able to function despite yeah. the seeming decline of the Duterte's health, okay? Yeah, so, despite yeah. the sweet health. How do you think the regime is able to function despite the seeming decline of Duterte's health? So anybody from the panel? Anyone? Uh, let me call on perhaps Mark first to give it a try. Okay. Um, <laughs> as an FOJ, <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, uh, just the thing that occurred to me when hearing that question is, so why, you know, Trump's machismo when his, you know, he was stumbling around, uh, Trump, when he when he was active, was on the golf course rather than governing. Um, I think, you know, it points to the the, the force of personality, the, the myth of the personality. Um, and, uh, you know, the narrative, as you've uh, stressed in your remarks, uh, the strength of that is so powerful that the physical strength is, is less necessary. Uh, you don't have to actually ride a jet ski to uh, confront China in the West Philippine Sea. You just have to talk about it. Uh, and uh, that's easier to do, uh, or it's best to do that when you're not in good health, because I think a jet ski uh, trip would not be very good for the president. Okay. Thank you, Prom uh, Professor Thompson. I think, sir, Contreras... Uh Ask a question, sir, please turn on your mic. Okay, uh, uh, very good presentations, Mark Cleave and uh, Ronnie and the team. And I, I, I would like to just, uh, this isn't a comment, this isn't a question, more of a comment to Mark, when there's a point about the Pasaway as a discourse. Actually, the Pasaway as a label has already been existent prior to its appropriation by the government. And so maybe the correct word is appropriating it. They have appropriated the word Pasaway because here in Laguna, it is a common word. You know, we use Pasaway to call out people and it is not a political con construct, but it has been politicized. Uh, so, and, and then the second, and, and I think that's, 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 that's how the, the anthropologists frame it, but I guess uh, we need to point out that it is not emerging. It is, has already been, it has always been there. Uh, uh, for Cleve, uh, the point about crisis as the one that triggers populism can indeed explain, but how do you explain the fact that, for example, Narendra Modi is losing ground in India? In fact, he lost an important election in West Bengal, and he is not doing well in, in elections in Kerala and Tamil Nadu in the recent elections. So he's losing ground. 
uh, you have Jair Bolsonaro is losing a ground as well. His popularity uh, plummeted from 37% to 26%. And his disapproval rating is 45% in, the, in one of the recent surveys conducted. So how would you then frame it? Why is it not happening to Duterte? Why is it happening to Jair Bolsonaro and and and, uh, and uh, and Modi, you know, was it what is in India and in Brazil that is not in the Philippines? Maybe you we can, that's a big question to ask, may not have time to answer, but it is something that can trigger us and make do comparative study. Now, on, on, on the study on, on the list, uh, I would like and very impressed with the way uh, it's unfolding, except that my concern is methodological because there are concerns about these experiments, and if you're using comparative comparison of means. So, because I think that's that's the major methodology, well, the way you establish whether you're going to accept or reject a hypothesis. You compare means, the statistical significance of means, and there are there are publications that came out. Uh, they people they, they are arguing that this kind of uh, of uh, methodology may not necessarily be statistically reliable. For example, there is a publication by Blair and Imai that sort of advanced or forwarded uh, a more, they, they develop a statistical analysis that is more uh, using regression analysis. So so it, it's more like uh, it's good, but maybe because it's more nuanced, uh, not only, and I have no problem with the possibility of randomization uh, because it's a part of a bigger study by uh, Pulse Asia. But in terms of how do you make sure that the variables are 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 do are very that are 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 are, are contributing to the conclusion, and that, because that's one of the main problems about list uh, experiments. So that's that's that that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Tonton. Uh, these are very good uh, comments. No, can we have our panelists uh, quickly respond to uh, Professor Tonton's? Uh, uh, comments. Uh, let's start with uh, you, Kofer. Right. Well, thank you so much uh, for your comments. Regarding the Blair in my article, I haven't, well, read it, well, honestly speaking, so I cannot uh, address your concern at the moment. But I will, let's, well, let me say it this way. Uh, actually, uh, Hirohumi is the one. Uh, most uh, expert on the experimental method and let me consult with, with Hirohumi uh, and perhaps well, I would like to email you about your con uh, about your question. Yeah, okay, yeah, you call, I can I can email you the article. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Right. Or, or, or hand it on to Ronnie. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, I also, if I may, I would like to take this opportunity to address uh, what uh, July has raised or concern that July has raised, which is that, uh, well, if I may interpret it, your comment correctly, I'm, I guess you are saying, July, that uh, our study is somewhat trivializing the moral economy of people in the Philippines. And uh, to this type of interpretation, I would like to say that uh, there is a distinction between brain, being brainwashed and falsifying preferences. And uh, what we figured out was that in, in our study, we are, we are not showing that the people are Filipinos uh, brainwashed by the propaganda. But we are showing that the, actually people are smartly, how can I say, um, mm. protecting their true preferences by not showing or by not revealing. Right. And uh, that was what our seven uh, experiment revealed. I hope that Yes. Your oh, I was just I was just uh, pointing to uh, uh, an alternative literature that's emerging that's questioning uh, similar studies of herd mentality, no, or uh, or those uh, uh, looking at uh, trolling and the social media, no. 
uh, of course, uh, we've had previous uh, classic works that looks at the uh, the view from below, no? like Samuel Popkins, The Rational Voter, or even uh, Mo Moral Economy, uh, and Mark has also written about moral economy of the poor. You know? So I'm just uh, I'm just uh, raising that for you to clarify that your 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 study is different and that uh, you are you're aware of this criticism. Okay, thank you, Yuko. Uh, Cleve, uh, any response to uh, Tonton's uh, comment? Yes, um, thank you, Prof. Tonton, for um, your question. Uh, I have two responses to your um, questions. Um, I think the first one that I'd say is that um, in terms of um, the decline in the popularity of um, populists, I, 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 I don't um, study Trump, I don't study U.S. politics, I wouldn't really include that in my uh, consideration. But um, with uh, Modi, uh, um, Bolsonaro, and Duterte, I think it's not, as the least experiment would also tell us, it's not that um, there's no decline in popularity, apparently there is, but the magnitude is not as we have expected, considering how um, poorly managed the pandemic um, in this country. So, I mean, Brazil, India, the Philippines, we are um, in the, we're always in the top list, um, more for Brazil and India. And uh, so, so despite the decline, um, the, the, the decline um, in the, in some popularity of some populist leaders, it's not as, um, yeah, the, the, the magnitude is not as grave as we would have expected. The other thing that I wanted to say is on the uh, the uh, the elections in West Bengal under Modi, and as I've said, this is quite a big question. But um, the thing that I could offer, the insight that I could offer, is that apart uh, for from my from my uh, research, I'm also um, seeing that local elections, uh, as as we would have expected, have really very different dynamics than national elections, and it's not always the case that it's not always the case that populist charisma on the national level would translate to electoral victory um, during local elections. And I think we have cases um, in the Philippines as well, where in uh, President Duterte, um, nagbabal or you know we really went down to some areas, although just a few uh, campaigned in 2019, but that didn't really translate to an electoral victory for him. And, that's probably also what's happening um, in the case of West Bengal. It's more clientelism, as um, as I've uh, read uh, some observations about what happened. It's really uh, more about clientelism. So you would you could say that in local elections, maybe voters choose to because it's closer to them, and that's where service delivery is um, uh, might be affected. That they still uh, prefer clientelism over populism. But that's um, a very uh, a very uh, preliminary insight uh, from me. Um, I'll, I'll take a look um, into your question uh, more thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we only have uh, ten minutes left. Do, so, do, do uh, I, Mark, I, yeah, quickly, just very Mark. Quickly. Yeah. I just, I just want to uh, also thank uh, 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 Professor Contreras for his uh, great questions and also for his, you know, thoughtful commentaries uh, previously to to, to this. Yes. Uh, um, and uh, just quickly, on Asawai, certainly true, he's securitized it. I'm drawing on the work of Hapal, who, who, who makes that point clear. Secondly, I think he raises a very important point about the Tate is different. I wrote a paper for the uh, Association of Asian Studies uh, Conference, and, you know, the Tate is similar to these other populists, but he is more popular. <laughs> and we have to see that uh, and uh, have to recognize it and have to uh, explain it. And even if we have to deduct uh, one third of his popularity, uh, due to, you know, uh, uh, this uh, uh, social bias, it's still more popular. He's not a minor minoritarian president in terms of popularity. Thank you, Mark. Uh, perhaps we should uh, hear from uh, Ronnie himself, no? uh, president of Pulse Asia. Do you have any thoughts on what we've been discussing so far? Ronnie? It's Ronnie with all. Oh, he, he froze. Okay, so uh, Jane, can you... Uh, Read some additional questions uh, uh, while waiting for Ronnie. Uh, this is a very specific question for uh, the third speaker from Dr. Rood. Uh, is there a correlation between SDB and education? Let's collect the questions and then uh, we'll ask our panelists to, uh, to answer. Uh, can you read some more questions? Uh, okay. 
uh, from John Chester, if Sara, Duter if Sara Duterte decides to run for president next year, would she inherit the type of populism his father has or would she be creating her distinct brand? Okay, so question of transferability okay, of the brand. Yes, for Sir Cleve from Rochelle Floron, the fourth, given the popularity or I would say manufactured popularity due to his populist narratives, what do you think should the narrative or the campaign's central narrative of the opposition to possibly shatter this manufactured popularity and eventually change the tide? Another from uh, Miss Dakila, how do you relate the president's use of foul language and his demeanor in different fora to his seeming popularity? Okay, so let's uh, uh, close with that because of uh, a lack of time. Uh, Ronnie, are you with us already? To give I, you a few, okay, yeah, a few uh, minutes to, to say uh, anything regarding your, your paper. Uh, yeah, I, I heard the comments given by Tonton, and uh, yes. as you pointed out, we're still at the initial stage of really crafting the paper, and there are many other things that need to be looked at, including a question that has been raised by Steve Wood as to whether the educational attainment or level has a relationship with social desirability. It's one of the things that is commonly raised with respect to surveys. But as you pointed out, July, it's important also to note that there's this agential component. Uh, one thing that I raised before, while you can say that there's social desirability or climate of fear, eventually it also translates to the type of political behavior that they may engage in. The people are fearful right now if they act out what they think others believe they'd still do the same in 2022. And I think that that's a challenge for, for uh, segments or groups that are trying to foment change. How do you mobilize people to go beyond their sheltered uh, existence and to voice out? And is this an indication, not of illiberality, but more in terms of the lack of commitment to democracy or the ambivalence of the public? Those are the things that basically, I think we need to uh, thresh out uh, as we craft this paper. So those are just my comments. Another comment that I'd like to give is with regard to the crisis that Cleve has pointed out. I don't think that the, the third administration has gone into really a very serious crisis, but it's bound to face a crisis now as the elections flow nearer. There are more critics and the critics are coming from within its camp. Let's see how they handle that type of uh, criticism because they've muted the criticism from the opposition, but what do you do with regard to critics coming from within your own ranks? Yes. Okay. There. Thank you very much, Ron. Okay. Uh, let's have uh, a few minutes uh, for our panelists to uh, reply uh, to respond respond to the questions raised. Uh, would like to start off, uh, Mark. Me again. Okay. <laughs> You're I'll the original the... FOJ. I'll, uh, exactly. <laughs> Which the DOJ will not investigate. It's. Uh... <laughs> It's, it's it's allowed. It's it's uh, okay. it's legal. Uh, the the thing is, uh, uh, the question I'd like to take up is the one of Sarah Duterte. Um, I've done some research, as some of you may know, about female uh, uh, dynastic leaders, uh, and uh, there are a number of of, of these leaders uh, who are of interest. And, and but the most relevant, I think, are the ones who succeed authoritarian leaders. And you think of Park Wen Hee in South Korea, but also. Um, Kiji Fujimori, Fujimori in Peru, who just recently lost, apparently, although I'm sure she'll claim she won uh, an election. Uh, it's interesting. So gender plays a role because you kind of are able to offer illiberalism light. You kind of embrace the popular part, but you kind of play down the illiberalism. Although Sarah will have a hard job doing that, perhaps because of her images punching a sheriff in the nose one time in Davao. Uh, nonetheless, I think that the gender aspect is important, even though she will, of course, embrace the signature, uh, the core, you know, brand elements, as, 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 as Cleve would put it. Yupo? Uh, Any additional uh, comments or response <clears throat> to the earlier question? Right. Well, basically, I would like to thank everyone for the inputs. Well, just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my name. Uh, addition to what Ronnie said, uh, actually we did uh, explore the 
impact of uh, education, uh, which is really still um, the preliminary stage, but we didn't find uh, anything statistically significant. And that's, that's just a footnote. Thank you so much for your comments. Okay. Clean? Um, the question on um, what narrative should the uh, anti-populist um, group should adopt, I wouldn't presume to, uh, to, to really know um, what um, narrative should they adopt. But I think I, I'll point them to two things that I know from the scholarship on populism. One is that um, for, uh, for opposition groups to also adopt, as, in, uh, as uh, Dr. July um, said, to, for opposition groups to adopt a similarly polarizing rhetoric, is something that also invites and even um, uh, and it, it invites a backlash no, from the populist groups. No? Right now, for example, we see that there are uh, multiple successors to the legacy of the Dutter Peace Mukhang. But if there will be one united um, opposition and um, the rhetoric will be very polarizing, you might expect that they might see uh, the, the light and also um, come united and as polarizing as they could possibly be, right? The other thing is that um, I, um, we, in terms of like some populist mobilizations, depending on their strategy, they end up endangering democracy um, themselves, uh, so of course they do mobilize against uh, they they do mobilize against populists because they want to quote unquote save democracy, right? But some strategies would also make them an enemy, if you will, if you can say that of um, democracy, right? We see it, for example, in Thailand, um, where they invited a military coup, right? Um, uh, the uh, the coup against um, Erdogan as well, right? So. Um, I, I would say that um, there is a, a big space um, for uh, anti-populist groups, like in terms of like the strategies that they could uh, pursue. But they have to take pay attention to the dynamic populist palette, politics to be able to not endanger democracy, and hopefully they will win power if that's their goal. Thank you. Okay. So uh, with that, I know I'm sure there are still a lot of questions, and this is a really a timely topic, especially uh, within the context of the upcoming election next year. So, uh, but hopefully we can organize some more uh, sessions like this, and we'll have uh, uh, all of these FOJs back together in some future <laughs> webinars. Uh, but uh, I'm sure you will see uh, us again, you know, in the near future and uh, in the runoff to. Uh, the 2022 election. So on behalf of the executive board or uh, the board of trustees of the Philippine Political Science Association, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their excellent presentation. Let's give them all a virtual round of applause. And uh, thank you very much for all of those who attended this panel. Uh, uh, we still have uh, uh, more interesting panels uh, uh, this afternoon and for tomorrow. So again, on behalf of everyone, maraming maraming salamat po uh, and keep safe.